12.1 electrons in atoms. These are the objectives that we're going to cover. First of all, you must memorize the definition of ionization energy. The first ionization energy is the energy required to remove one mole of electrons from one mole of atoms in the gaseous state, the gaseous element. If you don't use the word gaseous, you're likely to get the whole question wrong. And you also need to write one mole, but usually they have the word gas underlined in the mark scheme, which means if it's not there, uh, you get the question wrong. Have a careful look at the symbolic representation of that. Here we have the fact that its chemical equation means it's one mole. Here we have the symbol, the gaseous state written in there. And here we have just one, the first ionization energy. And that's taken an input of energy, of course, so the delta H is positive. As I mentioned in standard level, as you get more and more energy into this, the electron just eventually gets lost. And so the upper limit of convergence here is the place where the electron is lost. And so that's the ionization energy. So we can use this spectral graph to work out what the ionization energy is, going to our data booklet and using these formulas right here. So here we have nu, which is frequency, which is here, pronounced nu, which is frequency. Why didn't they do an F? I don't know. All right, and there's Planck's constant, which is in your data booklet, speed of light, which is in your data booklet. Uh, you might be given this, and you might need to work out this or vice versa. So going into some problems now. Problem one, determine the energy of a photon of red light given the wavelength as 650 nanometers. So how do we solve this problem? E is the energy, wavelength here is lambda. And so we get all these equations here from our data booklet. And so speed of light is frequency by lambda. Energy is Planck's constant by nu, which is the frequency and we can get all those numbers and write them in. Okay, so what we can basically do is, is use the wavelength here to work out what frequency is and then use the frequency to work out the energy. So summing in those values there, we get the frequency to be 4.62 by 10 to the 14 per second. We then sub substitute that into energy and that gives us 3.02 by 10 to the minus 19 joules. So that's the amount of energy in one photon in a red wavelength at 650 nanometers. Problem two, determine the first ionization energy of hydrogen given that the shortest wavelength line in the Lyman series is 91.16 nanometers. That means that at beyond that point is the limit of convergence. So at that point, the electron comes off. So that is our ionization energy, our first ionization energy. And so what do we have? Uh, we need uh, the ionization energy, so we're going to have to convert it to moles. If you've forgotten what moles is, that's also in the data booklet. So I'm getting all the constants and the equations from the data booklet. And so I sub that in, and I get the frequency as 3.29 by 10 to the 15 per second. And so again, I just sub that in, and I get the energy is 2.18 by 10 to the minus 18 joules. So that's the energy of a photon, times that by Avogadro's number, which is in your data booklet. And so that gives us the energy from a, a whole mole. And so that ends up being 1,312 kilojoules per mole. Now the two most important things when considering what influences the ionization energy is how many protons are pretty much in the nucleus. So the, the size of the nuclear charge are words you want to use. And also uh, the distance from the nucleus, basically. Uh, so how much energy the electron has, how much energy it is attracted, how easily it is attracted to the nucleus because of the distance it is and the shells that it has. And the nuclear shielding uh, is probably the the third thing that you would kind of consider uh, that doesn't, the third one is not uh, often in the uh, mark schemes as much as the first and the second. So here we have the size of the nuclear charge increases. So if you have more protons in here, as you go across the periodic table, if it's the same shell, and then you're going to have an increase in ionization energy because this is going to be more attracted to it. So it's going to take more energy to remove it. Here we have uh, the distance that it increases. So if the electron is in a, an outer shell, uh, it's not going to be as attracted to the nucleus. And so 
because the distance is further it's easier for the electron to come off because the attraction is not as great. Also not mentioned here as I said the third thing is because there's if it's an outer shell there may be electrons, electron shielding blocking that. Electron shielding. So now we, we're getting close to the next unit, uh, ionization energy. So as you go along here along the periodic table they're all in the same main energy level so they're all in the same shell but what you're going to have is the protons are gradually increasing and so the nuclear charge is increasing and so the first ionization energy the attraction is getting stronger and stronger and the distance is the same so here we have the actual values here and as you can see uh, sodium to argon here sodium down to argon here in the periodic table what you have here is an increase in ionization energy now it's important to have a quick, quick look at the points where it has dropped the inconsistencies here and you're going to have to be able to explain those and the reason for those are what's going to happen here is the electrons have joined uh, to another orbital here and here you've started doing the Hun's rule and so what you've got the reason for the drop here is mutual repulsion so the electrons being taken away from just a normal orbital here all in the, the px py and pz are all pretty much similar but once you take an elect once you put this here there is some tension here some mutual repulsion this you're trying to put two electrons in the same orbital they're not liking that because you're putting too much negativity close together and so it's slightly easier to pull that one away than it is to pull just something that's by itself there that doesn't have any tension in there. Okay, so that's the reason for the drop and the word is going to have to be mutual repulsion and that's going to be because uh, there are two electrons in the one orbital. This one here this one's much easier because it's, it's not a full shell so it's not inherently stable whereas you once you've removed that electron from that 3p you get to f full sublevels all right it's not as good as stable as having a full noble gas where all the energy levels are full uh, the, the old way that we understood the electron shells in IGCSE and so that's got the highest because they, they're pretty much unreactive, the noble gases. This is sort of like the second, uh, the second sort of stage where it's it's not a completely full shell, but has a full sublevel. And so putting pulling one electron out and making it go back to a normal sublevel is a good thing. And so that that's why you get that other drop, that other inconsistency. So make sure you can explain those this drop here and this drop here, they love to ask those questions and you need those to understand the graphs. So here we have uh, a, a better explanation because of the diagrams here. So why is the ionization of sulfur less than phosphorus? Because we're getting an increase in nuclear charge. Here is the explanation, the mutual repulsion uh, of the paired electrons. Having the unpaired all complete is much more stable. Now we're in a position to have a look at the graph. Uh, explain the graph in as much detail as possible and show where the breaks in the patterns occur. So this is uh, first ionization energy, which is important to note because there's a, you can also get uh, just a single atom and you get the second, third and fourth ionization energies, uh, which will have a similar concepts. And so what you have is an increase here because you have the same shell but an increase in nuclear charge and again as you go to the next shell you're having a general trend of an increase and here a general trend of an increase because basically you're jumping shells and so once you jump to another whole shell it's further away from the nucleus and so this jump here is due to a shell a much much larger cell so it's much much easier to pull it away again here this big jump here is due to an extra shell uh, this increasing here is due to nuclear charge uh, because it's all in the same shell and so what you're doing is basically all you're doing is within the same distance you're, the only thing you're doing is increasing the number of protons so that's why the first ionization energy increases across a period and now the only other differences in these trends are these small jumps here and this is going from an S to a P shell so you're removing the P electron here is, is a, a better thing 
and here this one is the P123 so this is the mutual repulsion one here so again here this one here is the mutual repulsion again and this one here is is the S to the P so make sure you fully understand all those little quirks of these graphs so just to recap here, uh, across we said nuclear charge was causing an increase in ionization energy. Down the group is a decrease in ionization energy because of the f increased shells. So it's on a further, it's in an outer shell. So it's a much greater distance from the nucleus. And remember distance is much more effective than the, the size when we're talking about forces in general, uh, such as gravity, it's on, it's gravity, is uh, the distance is squared, so it's exponential, the distance, so that applies for all forces, including magnetism or Coulomb's law, static electricity. And so what we also mentioned is the shielding. There's not only the distance, but there's also this repulsion going on and this blockage going on, nuclear shielding. So moving on to successive ionization energies now. Uh, this is how you write it. It's it's already lost one electron in the second ionization energy. It's just must be in the gaseous state, of course, otherwise you won't get a mark. You remove one more electron, and so that's the second electron now, so now the substance is two plus. And in a similar way, as successive ionization energies, it's going to be much, much harder, and the reason for is going to be nuclear attraction, and there's also going to be jumps being seen with different sublevels. So let's have a look at a graph. This is the successive ionization energies of calcium. If we look at the periodic table here, we can see calcium here. It has two electrons in the 4s level, and then it's going to jump down to a noble gas, which is going to be extremely stable. And then there's going to be some difference here between the mutual repulsion. There's going to be some difference here as you go from a full, uh, a half full uh, sublevel to a full sublevel. So let's see if we can see that in the graph. Here we can see the first ionization energy here and the second ionization energy here. And the only difference in that, it's the same shell. And what we have is just a increase in the effective nuclear charge. Now the nucleus hasn't changed, but the ratio of electrons to protons has changed. And so the effective nuclear charge, relatively more positive for the remaining number of electrons. So that's a useful term to use. And so what you now have is the big jump because this has gone to argon and this has got a full, nice full shell. So in order to remove that, well, now it's gone to this argon, in order to remove that third electron, so the third ionization energy, is a huge jump up here. Now again, you see increase in the nuclear charge and there's a little bit of a jump there, but not really major. Uh, I think perhaps if we blew this diagram up, we could might see a bit of, bit of a better trend in these. And so we can see that this here is all this pretty much the same shell. And so what we have here is we're removing these P's, and then we start removing the S's. And so there we get another big jump again, because we've gone to another sort of noble gas. So you may get a diagram that sort of expands and blows this one up here to talk about it, but in this particular one here, the only effective thing we can really see is the major changes in principal energy levels. This one's the first, uh, and this would be the second, and this would be the third and fourth. Hopefully that's enough information for you to work backwards or forwards and go work through those different types of graphs.